Hello, truth seekers and researchers. This is an illustration of what I believe is happening and is being modeled in order to create debt slavery for people all over the earth. And so I'd like to spend probably about 30 or 40 minutes uh, going through some factual information uh, that will help us identify the different uh, parts of this uh, illustration. The donkey, the carrot, the cart. Uh, this one's pretty easy. Society. That's us. That's, uh, that's businesses, that's uh, people, properties, lifestyles, everything. Uh, of course, it's all mostly centered around money and a financial system. So that's what we're going to look at as what's being played out or what's being modeled uh, to bring about uh, the uh, demise of certain aspects of society. This is nothing to be afraid of. This is something to be enlightened by. Uh, I think, in fact, that uh, what we can see going on, if we just uh, take a step back and have a look around at everyone else in society and what we might personally be feeling or doing, the way we are reacting, is all good because we can learn from it if uh, we haven't already learned uh, what seems to be going on behind the scenes, behind the TV screens, uh, what the intentions are for the events and the news and the propaganda and the marketing and the models that we are uh, surrounded by and are projected onto us as a society uh, on an increasingly, uh, uh, what's the word? vice-like grip uh, that intends to uh, bring about a great change, a reset, if you like. Of course, it's something that a lot of people have been uh, talking about for a while, those who have been able to uh, detach from mainstream media and be a proper researcher or analyst uh, with the ability to uh, see where uh, the donkey is being led <laughs> and uh, that's why I believe this is not something to be negative about this is something to be uh, quite positive about because it's it's very uh, transparent it's very easy to see now uh, what's what's going on um, so let me just take you through this and um, I think first it would be good to talk about models. This is the Copernican or heliocentric model uh, because um, it was a decision by Nicholas Copernicus uh, who was working in collaboration with the Catholic Church to uh, come up with a model that illustrated or described uh, the earth and its relationship with the sun and the moon and uh, a whole bunch of other assumptions such as uh, the earth being another planet and that planets are balls of gas or rock or the sun is a certain size or distance and uh, we have everything going around the sun. This was a model that was introduced uh, in about the uh, 14 or 1500s, I believe. Uh, we can just go back and check that. Let's see. Uh, 15, oops, 1543. Okay, so this Copernican model was introduced in 1543. And it was not based on any facts or findings other than uh, the time and location at which one can see lights in the sky. That's it. Uh, so this is an illustration that's based on time and uh, what we can see 
at any given time. That's all. Uh, you can uh, make this in a variety of configurations, uh, but this was the choice that was made for a heliocentric solar model. And within the space of 40 years, out came the Gregorian calendar, the solar calendar. And uh, this is a model as well, a model for keeping time based on the sun, the passage of the sun. Whereas uh, uh, using a lunar calendar uh, works just as well. There, is, there isn't one that's better than the other. In fact, they can be used uh, interchangeably depending on the purpose that you would uh, like to use these calendars for or these models for timekeeping. So we have the solar Gregorian calendar brought out, uh, became consensus within 40 years of the introduction of the Copernican solar system. Okay, uh, that consensus you could argue was forced upon uh, the scientific community and uh, the general uh, population uh, as some uh, as a, as a yeah, as consensus as the way we perceive our reality the way we interact with each other the way we keep time day and night all that so uh, we have a calendar uh, which you know, doesn't have to be argued in any fine detail it's just that it's all based on the sun so this is a model yeah and what we are going to talk about now is how we have models that are used today uh, to keep order or that are also used as control mechanisms uh, for society just as the uh, solar system and the globe and the Gregorian solar calendar have been used as uh, tools of control, mechanisms of control uh, to keep everyone on the same time and on the same planet as it were. All right, so these are models introduced uh, in the 1500s and uh, the models we are using today are obviously vastly more intelligent and uh, make use of artificial intelligence and computer processing power uh, that you could argue is vastly superior to uh, the calculations that we can do in our heads uh, but ultimately these are still uh, nothing more than models and uh, numbers and calculations uh, that uh, can be expanded and simplified or put into as much detail as you like uh, with any given scenario but uh, doesn't make them uh, any more real just because uh, one can illustrate or imagine them. So this is going to be kind of an investigation very uh, scratching the surface really it's just a, a way to uh, allow others to do their own research into the models that are backing uh, what we have here by the World Bank which launched the first ever pandemic bonds to support a 500 million dollar pandemic emergency financing facility or the PEF all right and this is all about using models uh, so just very briefly this was introduced in uh, 2017 uh, so uh, just a couple of years ago June is also an important date because these bonds are all uh, set on uh, timing that uh, will mature uh, June uh, 2020 and that's where we're heading right now we're already in March and we have this build up to June when these uh, bonds for the pandemic emergency financing facility uh, mature and there's a lot of controversy about them all right so uh, I'm going to okay I'm going to come back down here later on but uh, what uh, is a good thing to look at first is 
this one here very briefly okay this is a, a kind of recent article updated on March 23rd it's now March the 30th uh, so this is in uh, on the website Euromoney and it's asking when will uh, coronavirus COVID-19 trigger the World Bank's pandemic bond uh, so rather than go through what the World Bank says uh, this bond is we'll have a quick read through here and there's another article that will clarify it further okay um, so the March 5 update uh, corrected to remove additional requirement for an IDA country to have suffered at least 20 deaths before being able to apply for aid. OK, so this bond or these bonds or this fund is all about uh, uh, giving aid in, the, in financial aid uh, when certain criteria are met. And IDA countries are countries that are in within this uh, umbrella of, of the World Bank and uh the march 6 update latest clarifications from world bank confirmation that start of event was determined to be december the 31st uh, 2019 okay so this is when uh, the corona virus uh was uh, officially uh an epidemic in the eyes of the uh models that have been uh, scripted for this particular scenario okay a march 11th update uh, confirmation of growth rate and confirmation ratio assessment period running until april the 6th two days allowed for calculation so the earliest reporting date of whether all bond trigger criteria met is april the 9th okay so this is just again to keep in mind april the 9th is going to be an important date because it is at that point where uh it can be decided whether um these bonds uh pay out these uh, 500 uh, was it million or billion dollar bonds uh, pay out uh, to um, their investors or whether uh, they get reduced because there are payouts to uh, countries that have suffered under this coronavirus crisis all right uh, a World Health Organization situation report on Sunday, March 22nd, catalogued uh, 20, 2, 292,142 cases of coronavirus COVID-19 across 187 countries and territories, causing 12,784 deaths. OK, as far as the figures go, uh, again, anyone with um, just a slight inkling to do a little bit of research, and that really only means looking at the official figures and judging for yourself uh, whether your life is in any danger from some coronavirus uh, then you'll see for yourself that, um, that there isn't any more than there ever was it is just that uh, uh, flu pneumonia and uh, these kinds of symptoms uh, or diseases uh, have now been labeled and um, the uh, the um, testing of people uh, for this specific uh, it's, it's very broad it's not really very it's not very narrow at all it's a very broad label for um, the symptoms uh, of influenza uh, so um, slightly losing track there let's just carry on uh, so um, as of March 16th, the answer was uh, no. Basically, there, there won't be a payout. There shouldn't be a payout. Um, so there has to be this period of incubation and testing and uh, getting the results. So to, to kind of summarize this, if you have a look on the right hand side here, um, this is basically what, what they're looking at here. Uh, the World Bank pandemic bond trigger assessment timeline. So the start of the outbreak was December the 31st, 2019. And then you have after that a minimum initial 84 day period, which ends on March the 23rd. That has already passed now. And then the next date after that is March the 24th. And then assuming that triggers for total cases, total deaths and geographic spread are all met. Now, this is the criteria that must be filled in order for this um, payout of, uh, of a, a help from the PEF um, facility is given. And so then 
all those criteria are assumed to be met and then we have this uh, case growth rate and confirmation ratio data collection period of two weeks which ends on April the 6th so at this moment we are in this period of collecting data and talking about uh, the ratio, the number of uh, cases confirmed, the number of infections uh, against the number of people that are uh, going into ICUs or recovering or, 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 in, or perhaps dying. Um, so that's what that is. And then we have this final calculation period between April the 7th and 8th. So this will, in this period, that we are in now is where they are measuring all this data, collecting all this data from from testing centers and what have you to to be able to work out some ratios. And quite frankly, it doesn't matter whether everybody gets tested. All they need is um, the same as you need for any kind of mathematical model is you need a certain section of the population and then you can work out your averages from there. So they usually do these by the per thousand people and they work out their ratios and percentages based on every thousand people that were tested. So uh, that's all they need to do in that respect. And then we have the earliest reporting of status of all triggers, April the 9th. So basically April the 9th, uh, they are saying in this article, is the earliest date at which uh, it will be officially announced whether um, certain countries are entitled to receive uh, basic what is basically an insurance payout um, for being affected by coronavirus. Or will the private investors uh, of the funds and the bonds supporting this uh, emergency fund uh, get to keep their money and make a lot of interest on top? So uh, that's basically the timeline that we're talking about uh, for now. There is a lot more to it, of course, but um, this should put things into perspective. Uh, this was published in Nature, ironically, uh, on uh, the 13th of August, 2019. And uh, this is uh, this goes back to review what happened when uh, this pandemic, uh, these pandemic bonds uh, should have been used to help uh, uh, the countries suffering uh, with the Ebola outbreak. So uh, it says here that the World Bank's funding scheme for disease outbreaks drained potential resources from the Democratic Republic of, Congo, of the Congo, says Olga Jones. So this is quite a good article. It's worth reading through. So I'll, I'll do that just to save the hassle there. Uh, the final toll of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014 to 16 was more than 11,000 lives, plus an estimated uh, 53 billion US dollars from economic disrupt disruption and collapse of health systems. So this is all the money. So the losses, these are the losses. OK, 11,000 lives and 53 billion dollars in, in losses because of the outbreak, because everything came to a standstill. OK, uh, in the outbreak's wake, the global health community scrambled to deliver initiatives for increased health security. One health security, OK, insurance. Uh, one flagship program was the World Bank's uh, Pandemic Emergency Financing Facility, or PEF. Under the scheme, investors who buy pandemic bonds receive generous coupons, which annually pay about 13% interest. So all you've got to do is some quick math there. You invest, say, a million dollars. And after two years, uh, sorry, after one year, you're going to get 13% uh, interest on your million dollars if there hasn't been a claim uh, against this insurance bond. All right. So that's quite a lucrative investment. It's much more than you'd get anywhere in any bank on the high street. So uh, this compensates investors for the risk that the bonds will make insurance payouts to fight pandemics under certain conditions. Otherwise, cash returns to the investors where the bonds mature in July 2020. OK, so remember that this was launched in 2017 and uh, the bonds mature in uh, July 2020, which means that those investors, private investors in those bonds uh, will get uh, the bonds, uh, the, the bonds mature and they get the money back and the interest. So the world's uh, second largest Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of uh, the Congo has now entered its 13th month and has caused at least 1,800 deaths. It really doesn't sound that many after 13 months, does it? 
Uh, in July, the World Bank announced that it would, independently of PEF mechanisms, mobilize up to 300 million towards the Ebola outbreak. Meanwhile, the PEF has cost much more than it has brought in. The World Bank, where I worked for three decades as an economist, has not advertised the bond's exact terms. But I have ploughed through the confusing 386-page bond prospectus. The PEF has already paid around $75.5 million to bondholders as premiums, but has not disclosed how much they have been paid in interest. And it is set to pay much more. However, outbreak, let me just bring this up, outbreak responders have received just 31 million. Okay, so keep that there, all right, the, the people that the, the bonds and the funding is supposed to help received 31 million. Uh, the, uh, the people who invested in it got 75.5 million plus uh, much more undisclosed amounts from the PEF. And the much-touted potential payout of $425 million is highly unlikely. Twice as many investors signed up to buy pandemic bonds. So there's, you know, again, huge demand means uh, people make a lot of money as well, as were available. It was a good deal for investors, not for global health. Absurdly, discussions on a second uh, PEF are underway. And yes, uh, in July, basically, once these bonds mature in June 2020, in July, they're going to do another round of it. They've already announced that. OK, so this is great because this is someone who has worked at the World Bank and is now able to s say after doing extensive research with their own background knowledge uh, to reveal these um, these figures. So the PEF was backed by about 190 million in donations from three countries and the World Bank's International Development Association, uh, a fund that provides around $20 billion to the world's 75 or so poorest countries each year. All the resources devoted to the PEF would have been better used elsewhere. Instead of spending its funds and attention on partnering with reinsurance firms, uh, the IDA should have focused on improving public health capacity directly or on building up the contingency fund for emergencies at the World Health Organization uh, so that all money would go to countries in need. Former World Bank Chief Economist and US, Secretary, uh, US Treasury Secretary Larry Summers described the PS, PEF as financial goofiness motivated by government and World Bank officials eager to boot, boast about a creative initiative that engaged the private sector. OK, I, I'm not going to go through all the articles, but uh, this is still worth carrying on just to really get a picture of what's going on here. Early action against outbreaks is imperative because it is both if more effective and less costly. But making the bonds attractive to investors meant designing them to reduce the probability of a payout. The PEF stipulates a payout of $45 million for Ebola if the officially confirmed death toll reaches 250, uh, which occurred in the DRC by mid-December last year, but only if at least 20 deaths occurred in a second country. Given that the WHO, is, WHO lists only one multi-country outbreak amid more than 30 that occurred in a single country, this requirement is inappropriate. The DRC is much bigger and more populous than all three countries involved in the West African outbreak. All right, so basically uh, insurance criteria that were impossible to meet and so a claim couldn't be couldn't be made even though uh, this uh, the DRC was suffering uh, from an Ebola outbreak. The World Bank has said that the PEF is working as intended by offering the potential of surge financing. Tragically, current triggers guarantee that payouts will be too little because they kick in only after outbreaks grow large. What's more, fanfare around the PEF might have encouraged complacency that actually increased pandemic risk, following the false assurance that the World Bank has a solution. Uh, resources and attention could shift elsewhere. 
Rather than a lack of funds, vigilance and public health capacity have been the main def deficiencies. When governments and the World Bank are prepared to respond to infectious disease threats, money flows within days. In the 20, uh, 2009 H1N1 influenza outbreak in Mexico, clinics could diagnose and report cases of disease to a central authority that both recognized the threat and reacted rapidly. The Mexican government requested 25.6 million from an existing World Bank finance project for influenza response and received the funds the next day. For the 2014 to 16 Ebola outbreak, substantial funds started flowing nine months after it began. Financing was slow because the affected countries, the World Bank and the WHO, were not adequately monitoring the disease and global health leaders did not pay attention until the outbreak became a full-blown crisis. Increasing surveillance, diagnostics and other capabilities capacities for response to outbreaks will be more than flashy financing schemes to will do more than flashing fi flashy financing schemes to reduce threats from infectious diseases including antimicrobial resistance uh, World Bank analysis show that poor countries investments in core veterinary and human public health systems bring returns of 25 to 88 percent annually. OK, so uh, just to be clear, when um, when they do help out uh, poor countries with uh, financial assistance, they are doing it because they're going to get a very healthy return, 25 to 88 percent return on those investments all right so yeah they create a health facility or health system and they profit from it the world bank can provide robust financing and operational support for such investment it should make this a priority the Ebola outbreak in West Africa should have been a su sufficient wake-up call for the international community to establish a plan to get ahead of outbreaks. There have been uh, important improvements since 2016, including the reforms of the WHO emergency programs and external evaluations of in individual countries' core public health capacities. Now, this um, singling out individual countries now rather than insisting that they are uh, a, a collective of countries that have been infected is is quite important uh, I think uh, in the fact that uh, Brexit has just taken place so in the sequence of events uh, we had Brexit announced and kind of pretty much done very publicly uh, the UK was out of the EU and now uh, financially independent as it were of the other countries in the EU and I'm sure that is significant in uh, this here the fact that uh, these uh, way of evaluating countries and outbreaks in those countries has now gone to uh, include individual countries so uh, just to finish uh, but the best investment of funds and attention is in ensuring adequate and stable financing for core public health capaci uh, capacities the PEF has failed it should an end early and IDA funds should go to poor countries, not investors. OK, and now this, remember, is from someone who worked at the World Bank for three years. Uh, what did she say? Uh, the World Bank where I worked for three decades as an economist. OK, so uh, this person, Olga Jones, uh, does have that inside information. And uh, she herself is saying that... Uh, the the funding has paid out uh, for its investors but not for the people it is alleged to support all right now uh what i'd like to go on to discuss really here is that uh how all these evaluations are made the criteria for uh what is considered an outbreak uh, and uh in order to get uh, an almost impossible insurance payout and so this is on on that page that we started with um, uh, that it was uh, published in, on 20 uh, on June 28th uh, 2017 uh, by the World Bank uh, on its own website uh, but what's important here is let me just get to it um, right this paragraph here all right uh, the bonds and derivatives for the PEF's insurance window were developed by the World Bank Treasury in cooperation with leading reinsurance companies Swiss RE and Munich RE. Air Worldwide was the sole modeler. 
using the air pandemic model to provide expert risk analysis, Swiss RE Capital Markets is the sole book runner for the transaction. Swiss RE Capital Markets and Munich RE are the joint structuring agents. Munich RE and GC Securities, a division of MMC Securities, LLC, are co-managers. Okay, it doesn't really matter if you do or don't know who these entities are or what they are. What's important here is this bit here, uh, that Air Worldwide was the sole modeler. So let's go and have a look at what they do. This is a company uh, that does risk modeling. And uh, right on their front page here, they're talking about uh, COVID and all these other things that they can model and basically create these uh, scenarios on what they would obviously refer to as a global scale uh, with um, by collating data and using artificial intelligence to present that data given different scenarios. So you've got the COVID-19 outbreak here and this is um, again you can read for yourself uh, what this is supposed to do um, but they're all different models climate and pandemics so yeah climate as well climate and pandemics seem to be um, models that uh, <coughs> excuse me have been used for well uh, several decades now I suppose to make predictions and uh, often have us cowering in fear that the world is coming to an end uh, because of whether it's ozone layers or uh, uh, you know uh, flooding or what have you the whole whole thing um, these are the kinds of models that um, uh, the uh, certain data is cherry-picked from uh, you know uh, sea levels could rise by two meters uh, swamping Hong Kong uh, this kind of thing um, so these guys um, air which is the sole modeler for the World Bank and and from which the WHO would also get its some um, figures uh, offer these software solutions and consulting services now they're not just any old company right these guys are big guns they are playing with the big guys um, <coughs> I'll come back to this page in a second um, now where was I gonna go okay just to see who these people's clients are or the, who we serve insurers okay insurance brokers reinsurers reinsurance brokers capital markets that's basically your financial markets yeah corporate risk managers head funders real estaters what have you all those guys playing with the stock market governments entire governments are these people's clients all right and regulatory and rating agencies and it's all about uh, catastrophes yeah okay the catastrophe risk landscape is evolving as are the tools to assess the risk uh, which of course these guys provide they are providing these models uh, so what I will go where was it sorry to jump about but let's just uh, make sure I'm getting the I want the right page okay no. No, no sorry hang on okay here here are more of their clients okay so they've already said that they work with governments and and, and what have you this and so we have these are all insurers okay uh, and they are hailing this uh, superior software to do their um uh, their you know make their predictions okay again this is something that you can go and look at yourself I'll, I'll put links in the description uh, but what you have here are these uh, massive uh, insurance companies and future stock traders and what have you yeah so a very uh, uh, impressive uh, portfolio there all right now okay let me see if this is the right one this okay this page uh, basically talks about the situation so far 
uh, in their own words. Now we can take the data at face value if you like. So even the data being provided by these people that have made models are really not saying that there's any great risk. Um, if we just go down to this bit here, uh, Dr. Doratoltaj concluded uh, there is high uncertainty around the fatality of the disease. We're talking about uh, coronavirus here. However, it is estimated that COVID-19 has a higher case fatality rate compared to seasonal flu, which is 0.1 percent, and a lower uh, CFR, so that's a, a case fatality, a fatality rate, compared to the 2003 SARS outbreak. Uh, which was uh, about 5 to 10 percent, they say. So uh, COVID-19 isn't even as deadly as SARS, uh, just a little bit more deadly than flu, so they say. So the current estimation for the average CFR ranges between 0.5 and 4 percent, all right? And of course, this is all uh, relative to the number of people that get actually tested uh, and the confirmed cases uh, uh, regardless, it's not the entire population, yeah? And the people that are going to get tested are the people that are paranoid and, you know, they are the your, your um, hypochondriacs and, and, and quite possibly uh, the aged that are, whose health is deteriorating, so they will be doing the checks, they'll be going into hospitals more than your average uh, uh, middle-aged person or teenager or kid. Uh, that uh, just gets a, a flu now and then and doesn't suffer too greatly from it. So according to the CCDC, among more than 72,000 patient records with 86% of cases between 30 and 79 years old, current estimation for CFR ranges between 0.5 and 4%. CFR is estimated to be more than 5% for individuals with pre-existing conditions such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory conditions, hypertension and cancer, and uh, more than 8% for people older than 70 years old. So again, you know, the, when they talk even, even this 8%, is talking about uh, a very small section of uh, the entire spectrum of society so when you take when you factor in uh, the entire population all the ages and their different uh, con health conditions and what have you then uh, we're basically talking about this eight percent is eight percent of sick people people are already sick with these um, very uh, bad diseases that are likely to help uh, finish you off so, currently there is no specific treatment available for this disease other than supportive care. There are some antivirals and other treatments currently being used to treat patients. So far, fatality is most common in older patients, with more than 8% of deaths occurring in people over 60 years of age, more than 40% of whom have one or more pre-existing known uh, comorbidities, including cardiovascular disease, diabetes and uh, malignancies. It is also important to note that people who are more than 60 years old are generally at higher risk for any type of pneumonia and not just COVID-19 pneumonia. Ah, so there you go. They have actually given you uh, the definition of COVID-19 being pneumonia. And the last time I looked at the figures, about 40% of deaths in old age um, are attributed to pneumonia. So, uh, or, or something very similar. So almost half of the people that die of old age uh, will have done so with uh, the symptoms of pneumonia all right so again the, the, there is not, nothing has changed here this these figures speak for themselves that uh, there's there's nothing new here you've got to die of something uh, something is going to uh, be present when you die in the form of a disease because things in the body stop working and so it is the way these figures are presented or modeled and manipulated that will then or, or published and presented to us that then brings about fear you can take all these figures and you can rearrange them and you, you know, rather than saying 0.5 percent you turn that into a number uh, and of course you know for example 72,000 patients uh, looks looks like a big number uh, compared to the, the smaller percentage numbers that we see here 
All right, so, okay, I wanted to just uh, go on to this bit about Air Worldwide. Air Worldwide provides risk modeling solutions that make individuals, businesses, and society more resilient to extreme events. In 1987, Air Worldwide founded the Catast Catastrophe Modeling Industry. Okay, so they're saying that uh, back then, th these guys uh, control this industry. They are the founders of this industry of modeling catastrophes. All right, and they are the sole modeler for the World Bank. All right, and today models uh, the risk from natural catast catastrophes, terrorism, pandemics, casualty uh, cash catastrophes, and cyber incidents. Insurance, reinsurance, financial, corporate, and government clients rely on AIR's advanced science software and consulting services for catastrophe risk management, insurance-linked securities, longevity modeling, site-specific engineering analysis, and agricultural risk management. AIR Worldwide, uh, a uh, very sac Na uh, NASDAQ uh, VRSK business is headquartered in Boston with additional offices in North America, Europe and Asia. All right. So these guys are controlling the models, everything that is presumed and assumed. So at the beginning of this, we looked at the Copernican heliocentric model and the Gregorian calendar uh, that became consensus uh, among uh, the controllers of the time, the Catholic Church that was telling everyone how they should live, the, the very clock they should go by, and of course, uh, uh, you know, the, the financial systems and everything that goes with that. And this is what we have today. We just have more models by these, this one very small uh, group of people controlling the entire global uh, market with their models when it comes to all the insurance futures okay so it really is all about insurance all right so uh, we've been there now I'd like to okay I, I won't play the video again it's something you can go and watch yourself but um, of course what what is to be understood is that the, the target audience for this website or for this company is of course private investors uh, people with a lot of money that want to uh, invest in um, some kind of futures stock or insurance uh, and the way they uh, promote their software and um, kind of try to provoke a call to action at the end is to inform insurers that uh, when uh, payouts are made when claims are made then uh, these people will lose hundreds of billions of dollars collectively as an insurance industry so the whole idea of software like this is to create all these different scenarios create your models and from that you can stipulate uh, uh, the the way claims or the limitations of the claims that can be made again it goes back to the number of deaths the number of uh, reporting uh, and, uh, and everything that's uh, uh, the, the st statistics that surround a so-called pandemic uh, so obviously as an insurance company or someone investing in an insurance company or bond uh, you want to be quite confident that there's very little risk of uh, payouts being made to those people who ha have uh, tried to insure themselves against this risk, this risk of a pandemic. Risk management. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you, uh, I, you know, go and watch that video yourself. I won't play it. Uh, and we shall move on. Uh, now, uh, this uh, just uh, we could. I think the the headlines that you see in here, they've got these people doing the the vaccine. Okay, so this does lead on because now we're going to talk about the vaccines. We've got a virus. 
or a supposed outbreak we've got a pandemic and of course what you're going you've got the problem and the the reaction is going to be we demand vaccines or that's what's going to be told to us and put across us and of course that's what we have uh, these days is this you know oh there's a vaccine on the way and we know that this will eventually be implemented so we we have this perception that there's a problem there's a pandemic and we have this uh, uh, fear of death unless we get a vaccine uh, so these are all tied in and we'll see how they're all tied in and, and again it doesn't take any uh, extensive research to um, realize who benefits in these cases so volunteers are going to try the vaccine um, but just uh, let's just 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 kind of look at some of these headlines first human clinical trial of COVID-19 vaccine was administered on Monday uh, four of the 45 volunteers received their first shot of the vaccine created by the National Institute of Health and Moderna a Boston Bay Boston based uh, biotech company interesting because um, the company we looked at just now, Air, uh, is also Boston-based. And okay, so we've got these volunteers that think they're doing a great job for humanity. It, uh, the vaccine was developed in 42 days, and um, I think where is it? I wanted to just look at okay, latest news. Okay, yeah, astonishingly, again we got this. Oh, Japan is seeing a surge in coronavirus cases after not implementing their all right so yeah they okay they're, well they're going to see a surge as because they're going to start measuring it the Dow climbed 691, 691 points led by healthcare firms <laughs> so this is again it all it's just there the dot you all you got to do is connect these dots healthcare firms are leading uh this climb uh on the Dow Jones index yeah because we all know that they are being bolstered now and healthcare firms for example uh, in the UK it's interesting isn't it if you think about what's happened with um, or I think it's about about half a million people or uh, individuals have uh, signed up as volunteers for uh, the NHS the the UK's National Health Service and this has been for quite a, a couple of weeks now has been uh, the slogan um, save the NHS course uh, you know Britain is very proud of its national health care service and really compared to many other uh, services around the world it's it's really not that bad uh, but of course a lot of people moan and groan about it but what we have now is this injection of human resources volunteers that are prepared to uh, basically distribute medicines and do this do that do the job of uh, what would usually be paid NHS workers for free in these times of crisis uh, and of course we've got the promise of ventilators and vaccines and all this other equipment and beds and what have you so healthcare firms are definitely going to benefit from these cash injections that have been uh, created um, by the governments with this um, alleged demand uh, but at the same time uh, the entity itself of the National Health Service if you think of it as a corporation uh, or, or something that has value uh, that can be uh, insured against or it can be used as collateral then of course now be, with this injection of half a million people as human resources um, the the National Health Service is, is now worth a lot more it has a lot more value and this is also just I suppose something important for anyone to understand that uh, we are all human resources uh, when we work for a company of course we are human resources and you have the human resources manager uh, we, we there is there is value uh, to the company to to have uh, obviously people uh, individuals working and at the same time uh, on a nationwide basis uh, individuals that uh, have a certain nationality are the human resources of that country so uh, you know the United States for example has uh, lots of human resources so does China uh, so it has uh, a lot of um, value in that sense uh, that can be uh, traded or swapped or uh, again as as collateral yeah uh, so we all have to keep that in mind that um, when you pay your taxes whether you pay your taxes or not or whether you're dependent on the system you are still a human resource 
uh, which can be used or can be uh, used as collateral and uh, so we have uh, yeah uh, more 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 silly headlines okay that's enough of that on on that particular business insider story so uh but i think this next one was quite interesting yes this is the one i wanted to kind of focus on more um here's what you need to know about the 1.8 trillion dollar coronavirus coronavirus bailout everyone keeps talking about uh well maybe for the us that is uh, of course we've got uh, rows of empty seats on an airline they are they are of course suffering and uh, this really is what this whole thing is about. It's about bringing down, uh, bringing corporations to their knees and then uh, they become indebted. And this is going to having this ripple effect all across uh, all these countries that are tied up uh, with this current economy. And by the way, one thing I heard today was this mention of you know, this is, of course, being acknowledged by uh, people in the government in the UK. And now they are talking about some kind of mechanism. At the moment, they're not referring to anything in particular, but they are saying that a mechanism must be introduced. Something new has to be introduced to solve the problem of insolvency that's already occurred because of the businesses that have gone out of business and I suppose it's getting close to at least a few weeks now uh, where a lot of uh, small medium and large businesses are suffering um, because they have stopped making money and there is no uh, real date when they can start making money again so it's all uh, it's all it's all about risk and how long these risks are going to go on for. So I, I, had, I did hear today on the mainstream news that certain uh, high street chains, retailers, are now going into bankruptcy or they are now having to uh, sell, sell off uh, their shares and basically become owned, into, either go into debt, into bankruptcy, or become owned by um, large financial institutions. And this is what's, what's really happening. And we'll come back to that picture with the donkey and the... The carrot uh, later. So uh, the federal government, this is in the US, is set to give a bailout to industries hardest hit by the coronavirus pandemic from airlines to tourism. OK, they call it a bailout. But as it says here, the next one, a bailout is not strictly free money from the government and could come in the form of loans or grants with limitations. Uh, here's what a bailout is. Uh, what could be included in one to address the coronavirus fall, fallout and a look at past bailouts in the US. OK, so um, again, this is quite a good, good uh, uh, bit of information here. And this is all freely available to us. Yeah, and it's really up to us to just do a little bit of reading and uh, evaluate the situation for ourselves. And you can see what's going on. Yeah, a government funded bailout is more complex than just free money from the government. The bailout, while still being negotiated, is likely to give financial assistance to major corporations, small businesses and individuals alike. The bailout will likely include grants, money not to be paid back to corporations, as well as checks to Americans to help boost the economy. Uh, it is also set to include loans to be repaid by businesses after they bounce back from the economic fallout. So again, the, the time limit on these loans, the, the interest rates, uh, the amount that has to be paid back will all impact these businesses. So even if they take out a loan and they think that they might be able to start paying it back at a certain time, uh, the, you know, the, the moment you take out a loan, you're in debt and you're, you're having to pay it back and you're having to pay back more than you made. So uh, or more than you borrowed. Sorry. So it is a dire situation to be in. You, you are indebted to these uh, insurers. Uh, the grants are also likely to come with some strings attached, such as limits on executive compensation or stock buybacks for the companies benefiting, benefiting from the bailout. So basically, uh, yeah, they have to, again, put up their stocks as collateral. If they can't pay it back, uh, they get owned by the uh, so-called financial saviors. All right. So what could be included in the bailout? Um, 
yeah you know again do your own research this is uh but i mean what what needs to be said here has really said been said but we've got fedex asking for a 54 billion dollar bailout and you know the airline industry uh, american airlines delta airlines united okay they've spent billions on stock buyback in recent years uh, the restaurant industry is asking for help as many restaurants around the country have been forced to close and lay off employees the national restaurant association asked the white house and congress for a 145 billion dollar recovery fund to pay employees and maintain financial obligations well okay yeah they they might get that money but then of course it will be loans with strings attached etc so they will have to pay it back all that money has to go back to uh, with interest the group also asked for $45 billion in loans and assistance in deferring mortgage, lease and loan obligations. OK, it's just tying everyone up in debt. It is huge. Uh, hotels are seeking help too. The American Hotel and Lodging Association, uh, which represents the Hilton Marriott, requested $250 billion according to a report by USA Today. The association is seeking $150 billion from companies to pay employees and loans and $100 billion for suppliers. Yeah, so again, just to keep, this is the thing, just to try and stay afloat, these guys will um, take out all this money, but ultimately they will be owned uh, by even larger corporations. Uh, chains like the Hilton and the Marriott, they are huge and they, they gobble up other smaller hotels and they build and it's funny to watch hotels changing hands. I mean, every couple of years, uh, a hotel might end up get, getting bought out by a larger chain and that's been going on for years. They're just gobbling them all up. And so, the, you know, the, the Marriott or the Hilton can have hundreds or thousands of properties dotted around the world that were already built. They didn't build them themselves. The buildings were built and then some hotelier did them and then they eventually came along and took them over at the right, an opportune moment uh, or, you know, you know, made a deal. All right. So the coronavirus bailout is set to be... Well, OK, these, these guys get it. All right. Bailout equals bullshit. Greed kills. Yeah. So they understand what's going on. It's just debt slavery. The coronavirus bailout is set to be more, much more costly than the Wall Street bailouts during the Great Recession. The bailout to help recover from the coronavirus fallout is set to top one trillion dollars, which is more, much more than the nearly 500 bi uh, billion spent to help Wall Street. I mean, that was a scandal in itself, wasn't it? So, you know, that was only 500 billion. Now it's a trillion. <laughs> <laughs> the Wall Street bailouts, which included $311 billion for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, $90 billion for the Trouble Asset Relief Fund, and $6 billion for small business lending, cost the federal government around $498 billion. So if, the, if, if something has cost the federal government uh, a load of money, they, of course, then turn to their human resources to recoup those funds. Yeah. Uh, the bailouts that helped the country recover from the Great Recession were and still are criticised as handouts to giant banks and eco echo criticisms that this bailout is more of the same. Senator Elizabeth Warren called for no more slush funds for no or, or, or no strings attached handouts for major corporations in the coronavirus bailout. So we do have people that are obviously aware of what's actually taking place and are trying to make their voices heard uh, but uh, what can uh, they do uh, it's just up to us, us as uh, individuals to to see what's going on um, again with more news stories it kind of just all i'm doing here is showing that you do not have to look far to find out the information that's already out there about how bad these schemes are and how they just put everyone in debt the World Bank Pandemic Financing Scheme serves private sector interests over global health security, new LSE analysis suggests. OK, so uh, this goes on the same thing. You, you get, you know, get to go through the information here and they're basically saying that, uh, yeah, the 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 uh, the investors in the bonds uh, benefit the, the countries that are supposed to benefit don't. All right. And uh, the Financial Times as well. World Bank's pandemic bonds under scrutiny after failing to pay out on Ebola. And again, we saw that Ebola was uh, very, very bad comparatively. Uh, so two years ago, the World Bank celebrated what it called a momentous step. 
and we've got these pandemic bonds okay so again the bonds are this pool of money that investors invest in they get huge interest and uh, the less payouts that are made the less insurance claims that are made the, the the more they get for not paying out yeah okay so uh, we have down here um, the financialization of risks is a new avenue for the privatization of profits and the socialization of losses said uh, Bodo Elmers head of policy at the European Network on debt and development <laughs> Euro dad uh, it would be better if donors funded the necessary assistance directly so we, we're, we're seeing the same sentiments echoed by uh, those who are against the way these funds are uh, created and how they don't pay out uh, the pandemic bonds came in two classes uh, one covering diseases such as influenza which pays investors a coupon of 6.5 percent over LIBOR and the other which covers Ebola and other diseases paying 11.1 percent over LIBOR so again it goes up to those that the 13 percent or so that we were talking about all right so again you know this is a pretty much repeating uh, the information but uh, what's also interesting in here is we we have again what we're talking about is bonds so we've got these um, uh, bonds there the catastrophe bonds and we have vaccine bonds okay so the catastrophe which is an outbreak of a disease which uh, or a virus that uh, can apparently be cured by a vaccine if we can find one we now have vaccine bonds also going in in tandem with this so this is again people funding these uh, uh, pools of money uh, hoping to uh, profit from that uh, without having to pay out uh, as much as they might uh, lead people to believe uh, this is an excellent article as well when the, the, the the, the other news report referred to where we have Larry Summers denounces the World Bank's PEF Ebola bonds that enriched investors at the expense of the sick in the Congo and of course again they're warning that the same thing will happen again with the coronavirus again I will try to lead uh, leave the um, uh, links in the description so you can just do your own research all right so there we have vaccine bonds okay vaccine bonds are a pioneering form of socially responsible investments an investment discipline aimed at generating competitive returns while making a positive social impact the vaccine bonds are investment grade bonds supported by binding government monetary pledges to support uh, Gavi's programs well let's go and see what Gavi's uh, programs are and but we'll just we'll, we'll get to that we've got this happened uh, when was this uh, this was 11 years ago vaccine bonds on sale for Japan investors in Feb so uh, you can see here that this was a trend started a long time ago uh, top rated bonds to raise 250 million dollars or more to help vaccine children in poor countries will go on sale for Japanese retail investors next month um, okay so we can see here just a bit of history really in the creation of these bonds and and how people have found them to be very very lucrative um, after a 223 million dollar equivalent bond sale in Japan a year ago IFFIM is looking to make another offering here in a mix of New Zealand and Australian dollars and South African Rand higher yielding currencies that have been popular with retail investors blah 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 okay uh, now again the okay proceeds from the IFF IM's bond sales go to support the work of the Gavi Alliance a public private partnership formerly known as the Global Alliance for vaccines and immunization so Gavi of course uh, has people like Bill and Melinda Gates involved so this is why Bill Gates is so uh, keen to push uh, vaccines and donate his money to these uh, vaccine alliance bonds vaccine bonds because ultimately he will profit from them uh, so we've all probably seen the videos of Bill going on about uh, doing a really good job and uh, reducing the population all right so yeah they you know gates foundation norway contribute one billion dollars to increase child immunization in developing countries eight to twelve billion needed for vaccine programs through 2015 donors called on to address a critical funding gap okay again read the stories yourselves and, and see 
you know they're not doing they're not philanthropists they're not doing this out of the kindness of their heart they're doing it for profit okay yeah so here's gabby officially gabby the vaccine alliance previously the gabby alliance and uh, before the global alliance for vaccines and immunization they love these name changes don't they just to keep up with the trends or to uh, so people can forget about what they did in the past okay brings together developing country and donor governments the world health organization unicef the world bank uh, the vaccine industry in both industrialized and developing countries research and technical agencies civil society the bill and melinda gates foundation and other private philanthropists again you can do do your own research but uh here are some of these things now there's again there's there's no denying on my part that um some of these things might have helped people uh or uh, entire populations uh i am not judging that here but uh as we we know um a favorite phrase of people like this and, and people in political power or with uh, connections to various industries that work alongside governments will say uh, never let a good crisis go to waste and of course if you are able to create that crisis then um, you you're going to be the the it's a, it's a win-win isn't it yeah so uh now Okay, I brought this up again. These these stories are coming thick and fast. It's changing all the time, and the reason we're getting new new updates and announcements all the time is because, of course, these models that uh, we have been uh, looking at here uh, boast that you can you can tweak them in real time, and they have uh, these layers. So uh, it just has, says here on the brochure for this for one of these software models not only can you combine exposure information for multiple lines of businesses with location specific hazard data but you can also leverage the power of touchstone's financial model to apply policy and layer terms to run geospatial analysis based on your exposed limits a full range of loss perspectives are available including ground up gross retained and net of pre cat pre catastrophe so basically what it's saying here is you can you can input all these um presuppositions and uh, you know data about uh, society the financial system everything the healthcare and how it's responding all of these layers can be put in to your model and it will spit out uh, these predictions so that's why we're getting these regular updates because they are referring to their model and it's okay so we've measured so many deaths so far and that changes it or doesn't or things change in this respect or that respect uh, that's that's why it quickly becomes very confusing and of course um, you know Boris and his mates uh, can't um, can't keep up in terms of um, appearances because uh, you know they they eventually get it and they eventually get blamed for not following the same rules that they're applying uh, to the rest of society so uh, of course what what Boris has by his side is a an advisor this is uh, Patrick Valiance chief scientific advisor uh, outlined the UK's response to the coronavirus on Thursday so um, again a lot of what Boris or any uh, prime minister or president is coming out with are just uh, is just the information that has been given them to them by their in this case the scientific advisor so scientists say so who is this guy who who did he work for what are his interests Patrick Valiance <sighs> British physician, scientist and clinical pharmacologist who has worked in both academia, academia and industry and has since March 2018 been the chief scientific advisor to the government of the United Kingdom. Okay, so he did his school and stuff like that, but his uh, career took him to become the... In, in 2006 he joined uh, GSK as head of drug discovery okay four years later so all right um, he basically became uh, the CEO in the end of uh, this pharmaceutical company GSK which is GlaxoSmithKline 
All right, and so here, this is the corporation that he was involved in just before he uh, became uh, Boris Johnson's financial advisor. In 2012, GSK pleaded guilty to promotion of drugs for unapproved uses, failure to report safety data and kickbacks to physicians in the United States and agreed to pay uh, $3 billion uh, settlement. It was the largest healthcare fraud case to date in that country and the largest settlement by a drug company. And that's only because they got caught yeah i mean but this is so you know the again do your research and this guy was the one who was there before uh and you know again just problems you know of all these kinds of accusations so there are all these connections you can go as deep as you want but all you need to do is just scratch the surface and and really it's nothing more than clicking on a few links and you can start to see the connections between the vested interests all right so and there's a lot of money and it's just uh what i suppose we need to do now is come back to this and now we've gone through the kind of characters in this pantomime we can look at who's who at the zoo so here we have this uh, donkey following a carrot, okay, and uh, of course the carrot's on a stick that's uh, inside this cart, and this is basically my way of illustrating what I see is happening right now with the global elite's corona coup. Uh, here is society, and of course uh, out the back here we've got uh, everything has been trampled by uh, the donkey, and you know you could see the donkey as um, a threat. So let's try and put uh, that here. What we have here is private investors in um, this fund that we talked about, these bonds, whether they are uh, the uh, emergency fund bonds or vaccine bonds or uh, other bonds that are based on uh, catastrophes, then you have these private investors in those. And of course, you have that connection with the World Bank. The World Bank creates these um, creates this pot, this fund, gets private investors and of course they invest with the promise of that pot growing and growing and growing. So that's what the World Bank is doing there. Um, now which, what should I do, what should I bring up next? Okay let's bring up, <laughs> let's just bring up these. Okay and we've got what we have here is uh, the donkey is the government and the media. Uh, and it is creating this threat. It is a threat to society. Uh, it's pushing out the propaganda, giving us all this data that's been modelled to put us in fear. So we are, we are at the moment in fear of being trampled on by uh, by this, whatever perception is being put out there. And of course, in this case, it's a virus threat. Uh, so we have a controlled outbreak, impossible insurance payout criteria. All right, and uh, I suppose what I need to highlight next is, uh, hang on, there we go. So the carrot is basically the World Bank's pandemic insurance payout. So uh, what we have is the government and the media are leading this circus with their models and trying to create that in society so that they can fulfill the criteria for the World Bank's pandemic insurance payout or not as the case may be but of course with all these uh, this web of tendrils between the government and uh, private uh, corporations and private investors basically it doesn't really matter whether the payout is made or not because there are people that are ultimately the world bank wins because um it's it's controlling all the money and uh, those investors will will win and uh Either way, they can win if there's a payout, and they also win if there isn't. But there might be, of course, these battles going on between people in in positions of, of power or influence, where, of course, the investors want to hang on to their money, uh, but uh, those who didn't invest will want to get a payout. They'll want a share of that money if they can create the uh, scenario or record um, things uh, to fit with the, the criteria for a payout yeah so ultimately what we have here is um with all this fear-mongering businesses forced to close to get into debt and sell 
cheap so this is you know society is being trump crumpled and trampled and trampled on uh, now of course the physical buildings they they don't actually go anywhere nothing actually physically gets destroyed all that's being destroyed is a financial system and uh, as these uh, uh, businesses are forced to close they get into debt and and then of course they have to sell uh, sell back to uh, the World Bank they come under the umbrella of these these large investors which caused the destruction or the downfall of these businesses they created a pandemic model they created the fear they created the reaction uh, companies are forced pretty much to close down uh, and of course within a very short space of time they go into debt and they are destroyed and picked up by the World Bank so let's just illustrate that with some arrows here to just see how it just goes round and around and around like that yeah okay uh, that to me sums up uh, what's what's going on as far as the World Bank and its uh, its pandemic uh, scheme investment scheme really but um, the the offshoots from this are so far-reaching and hidden that um, there's really little you can do no matter how far down the rabbit hole you go or along the web uh there's it's it's so complex because what what ultimately we have in this situation is um opportunists uh who who will always uh find a way to benefit from the situation so it's not just one body um it's a bunch of individual bodies and they're all you know a bit of a, a feeding frenzy really uh, a lot of them can see what's being brought about and they will push for uh, the collapse of certain things but ultimately what it is 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 that um, people and companies and corporations and entire industries and even governments go into debt because uh, the World Bank is there with the carrot making the donkey move forward uh, with with this uh, hope that it will get to eat the carrot but the World Bank never gives them the carrot <laughs> they've got an endless supply of carrots too <laughs> yeah round and around yeah so uh, does that matter no it's just the way it is it's very I look at this and it's it's very Zen in some ways it's just the way it is it's it's the it's the growth and decay that we see in the real world it has to happen regeneration death regeneration growth is how it goes things do not grow forever uh, of course uh, you know a tree or something can mature very gradually and elegantly and uh, for the most part they can be left alone to do that uh, but we have this constant interference and uh, just as things appear to be going swimmingly for a lot of people uh, we become relaxed we become complacent and uh, of course there are a lot of people on the sidelines saying hey you're getting robbed you're getting robbed uh, but uh, most people uh, or individuals uh, when everything's fine and dandy for them uh, they're not going to worry too much about uh, what's uh, what's going on how they're going to be uh, blindsided and uh, a few weeks ago if you'd or months ago if you told someone that uh, you envision envisioned that uh, the aircraft would stop flying and that the whole economies would collapse people would be off the streets and not going to work uh, and, and tourist attractions would be empty uh, you wouldn't have believed them it would have seemed impossible but this this is how fragile it all is uh, and it so it, it's a double-edged sword uh, it shows how easily we can uh, find ourselves in a situation that just crept up on us uh, or you know the boiling frog scenario where we just didn't get out of the pot in time and to be honest uh, who's no matter who benefits from this these people who uh, 
have invested in this or that are playing this game are really the ones who are living in a state of fear and of course they are telling us to be fearful of this non-existent pandemic or virus they are the ones in fear because they fear that uh, things won't work out the way the model says it should uh, there is one beautiful thing about the fact that we are humans and that is that uh, these artificial intelligence models uh, only really work on um, a basis of uh, crowd mentality herd mentality and you can get your averages and your ratios uh, like if you cast your net in into a, a, a school of fish then you'll get a, a net full of fish but that doesn't mean you get all the fish um, but that doesn't necessarily matter to them what matters of course uh, what it matters to are the people or the individuals that have invested their lives and their work and their property and their money into these things for example you might have a successful uh, restaurant owner who's managed to open two or three branches uh, that person now has so much more to lose than when they just had one little restaurant yeah all of a sudden they that's, it's simple the more you have the more you have to lose so those of us who are living without debt uh, without the need for all these material possessions and bling are those are the ones that are free the individuals that are very scared at the moment are those who who are threatened by uh, the potential loss of everything and they've already snapped up their loans and they've already uh, put up their collateral so this will be over very quickly because for the most part uh, a lot of these corporations and businesses that are uh, uh, working on a week by week or month by month basis with huge numbers of employees and a uh, huge amount of resources uh, will very quickly uh, see their own demise and it is only those of us who are who are free of that uh, who will not really be affected but that's the way it goes so I hope that's uh, been a nice little run through and uh, I just encourage everyone to do their own research and get real about the situation but again it doesn't mean that we have to be scared of it it's just uh, something that we can observe from a distance uh, and enjoy the theatrics because the show must go on. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>